true, you can't see it, but it's on me. There's something different about the kids, something funny. Maybe if I switch my jersey, they would love me. But what does it matter? You can't root in front of me. God help me. What the? Yeah, can't do this alone. God help me. God help me. Can't do this alone. the cash behind the diamond rings though i pay attention i'm listening
Behind the diamond rings, though. I pay attention, I'm listening to your lingo. Who I serve, he got eyes like an eagle. He see everything. I promise you won't get away without anything, girl. Yeah. <laughs> but that's the cold hard truth. I'm being honest, don't ever think that you know my mom. He ordered my steps so I know that I will never lose. I'm covered in unseen blood. Like I said, I truly can't see it. But it's on me. There's something different about the kids, something funny. Maybe if I switch my jersey, they would love me. But what does it matter? You can't root them for me. God help me. What the? Yeah, can't do this alone. God help me. God help me. Can't do this alone. God help me. What the? Yeah, God help me. Can't do this alone. God help me. What the? Yeah, God bless me. Can't do this alone. God bless me. What's the cash behind the diamond rings, though? I pay attention, I'm listening to your lingo. Who I serve, he got eyes like an eagle. He see everything. I promise you won't get away without anything, girl. Yeah. <laughs> but that's the cold hard truth. I'm being honest, don't ever think that you know my mom. He ordered my steps so I know that I will never lose. I'm covered in unseen blood. Like I said, I truly can't see it. But it's on me. There's something different about the kids, something funny. 
find me Maybe if I switch my jersey, they will love me But what does it matter if you can't move in front of me? God help me what the, yeah, Can't do this alone Cash behind the diamond rings, though. I pay attention, I'm listening to your lingo. Who I find, he got eyes like an eagle. He see everything. I promise you won't get away with my anything, though. Yeah. <laughs> but that's the call, I truth. I'm being honest, don't ever think that you know my mom. He ordered my steps so I know that I will never lose. I'm covered in unseen blood. Like I said, I truly can't see it. But it's on me. There's something different about the kids, something funny. Maybe if I switch my jersey, they would love me. But what does it matter if you can't move in front of me? God help me. What the? Yeah. Can't do this alone. God help me.
Trust me, yeah. Honest, don't ever think that you know my mom He ordered my steps so I know that I will never lose I'm covered in unseen blood Like I said, I truly can't see it But it's on me There's something different about the kids Something funny Maybe if I switch my jersey, they would love me But what does it matter if he ain't rooting for me? God help me What the fuck yeah. Can't do this alone, girl
What's the cash behind the diamond rings? No. I pay attention, I'm listening to your lingo. Who I serve, he got eyes like an eagle. He see everything. I promise you won't get away without anything. No. Yeah. <laughs> but that's the cold hard truth. I'm being honest, don't ever think that you know my mom. He ordered my stuff so I know that I will never lose. I'm covered in unseen blood. Like I said, I truly can't see it. But it's on me. There's something different about the kids, something funny. Maybe if I switch my jersey, they would love me. But what does it matter if he ain't rooting for me? God help me. What the? Yeah. Can't do this alone. God help me. God, well, God help me. Can't do this alone. God help me. What the? Yeah. God help me. Can't do this alone. God help me. What the? Yeah. God bless me. Can't do this alone. God bless me. the cash behind the diamond rings no. i pay attention i'm listening to your lingo who i serve he got eyes like an eagle he 
What's the catch behind the diamond rings, though? I pay attention, I'm listening to your lingo. Who I find, he got eyes like an eagle. He see everything. I promise you won't get away.
は女性には読までくれと。指でしない。今でではよく女性は。そうね。やらしいわけでござるわい。私は私のことで言います。If everyone can hear me, put a thumbs up in the chat. So that way we don't get too far down the road and then you say you can't hear. <laughs> okay? <laughs> And I'll make sure to talk into the mic. All right, perfect. So, everybody good? All right. So, the first thing one, I apologize. That's technical difficulties, but unforeseen technical difficulties. But I want to say that I'm sorry because I honor your time and I honor people's time and I made a commitment to be at a certain time. Okay? So, one thing I ask you to forgive me. Had I known that it would be that way, I would have d i d everything possible to assure that it wouldn't go that way. All right? Now, I made a promise that I wasn't going to mute any microphones. Now, earlier this morning, I felt like I was going to mute the microphone. However, now I'm going to definitely keep my promise that we're not going to mute the microphone, okay? So, one, please forgive me. I am deeply sorry. Okay, the thumbs up. Everybody's good. Excellent. So, they're saying it's low, so let's turn it up. Actually, Q, if you could help my son sing. Thank you. I imagine what we could do is turn it down in that speaker, but then turn it up there somehow. Thank you so much. So, although we have the thumbs up, just give us a second. He's tweaking it so that way everyone has a good experience, okay? Testing one, two. Hey, 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 hey. YouTube, does that sound better? Everything looks amazing. God bless you. Thank you. We wait on the Lord. The devil will not stop this kingdom movement. <laughs> Amen. Joy a n n a m o r e we're waiting on the sound. You have like a 10 second lag, so just give us a second, okay? Now, this is what I want you to do. For those of you who are in the chat, while they're fixing the sound, share this with the people that you got registered or the people that you know that are attending. That way, because I can guarantee most people are still at Zoom, and we tried to send an email link out to everyone. So share this so that way they can be a participant also. And we also will give a recording out to everybody. So that way everyone has a recording so you don't have to worry about trying to jot notes. Just listen and receive. Amen. Yo, already with the tax, you know it's going to be fire. <laughs> Amen. Okay, how's that sound on YouTube? So, YouTube, how does that sound? Quinn is engineering it for us, and it, it sounds better in the room, but how does it sound on YouTube? Are you guys getting better volume? I don't want to move forward teaching until everyone is on the same page. If this sounds better from when we first started, just put a one and then we'll start rocking. Great, great. Sounds great. Better. Yes, sounds good. Much better. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Okay, perfect. So everybody says that better. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to go ahead and start rocking. 
So again, I'm deeply sorry. Please forgive me. Tomorrow we will start on time. <laughs> okay? Tomorrow we will start on time. And I know I'm re limited to a time limit. However, we will go however long necessary to make sure by the time everyone leaves, they can hear God. Okay? That's my commitment. That by the time we finish tomorrow, however long it takes necessary for people to receive what they came to receive, they'll have it. Okay? Excellent. So let's start. So when we talk about unlocking the voice of God, this is what unlocking the voice of God is like. Unlocking the voice of God is like, I just, I'm going to put my phone on do not disturb so it doesn't get calls in. So I just put the phone on do not disturb genuinely to keep, to keep the phone from being a distraction. Now, as the phone is now not a distraction, service is cut off from this phone. However, all those services cut off from this phone, this phone is not limited by service being cut off. It still can receive everything that comes to it. So what does that mean? When I cut this phone off, if you decide to text me, it still comes through. However, if you decide to call me, on your end it goes straight to voicemail. However, on my end it is available for reception. That's what hearing God is a lot like. <clears throat> when you fly on an airplane, and you put your phone on, what they say? Hey, put your phone on airplane mode, right? Hey, put your phone on airplane mode, why? Because when you reach a certain altitude, the signal that you have is no longer valid. The reason it's no longer valid is because you've ascended higher beyond the range that that signal can reach you. So Father, our God, the Lord God is spirit. He is the Father of all spirits. He is higher than the heavens. So he's not even contained in the heavens, right? So we look at the heavens as if, that's the end all. However, the heavens can't even contain him. The, like, so we imagine it as though heaven is his home. However, the heavens cannot contain him. If he can be contained by it, he's not God. If he can be housed within it or limited by it, he's no longer God. So that's why it says that Jesus, when he ascended on high, he ascended far above all heavens. Why? because he cannot be housed within the heavens. The heavens can express him. So he can express himself within it, but he's not limited to it. Just like we saw him defy the laws of gravity, the laws of science, the laws of nature. We saw him defy all of that on earth. Why? He's not limited by it. Does that make sense? So then when we talk about unlocking the voice of God, it's very similar in that way where, while this phone is on do not disturb, no one can reach me. However, the moment I take it off, everyone who's texted me, everyone who's called me, everyone who's emailed me, everyone who's done any sort of communication to this device which can reach me, the moment I take it off, it's all there. Does that make sense? Literally, the moment I take it off, do not disturb, it is all there. That's what these couple days are gonna be like. You're gonna realize by the time we're done that man, my life was on do not disturb in certain areas. God has sent me certain notifications, I was unaware. It wasn't that he wasn't speaking. Right, so that was one of the requests that a lot of people said, to hear God more clear. God is always clear. God has never not been clear. Our reception is sometimes the issue. Right? Kind of like if you drive into an area, what do you say? Oh, man, my signal down. Oh, this is, I'm in a bad spot. That's the way the function of our spirit works. So the first thing you understand when we talk about unlocking the voice of God, <clears throat> we got to understand that God is spirit. Right? God, you have heard me say this before, God's not black. God's not Jewish. I mean, because every party thinks God belongs to them. So just as much as the Hebrew Israelites think God's belong to them, the Jewish people think God's belong to them also. However, God is neither. If he can be housed by it, he's not God. God is spirit. That's why he made us what? In his image and in his likeness. That likeness is first spirit. So when we talk about communicating with God, the first way by virtue of how he interacts with our entire being, and be mindful of what I said, how he interacts with our entire being, because we think God speaks here. This is carnal. This is a natural ear. This is a physical ear. God speaks to our spirit. It is through the other parts that we begin to interpret what it is God is saying to us. Does that make sense? So a lot of times, God is speaking to you in your spirit. However, it has to move from your spirit to your soul and then to your body. So the way we say it, 
your body, soul, spirit. However, God is first spirit. So we have to learn how to flip that on his head. Does that make sense? Excellent. So as we're talking about, and we'll try our best with this, right? This is just to help me, for you who don't know, this is just kind of a gauge to help me kind of track where things are. But I promise you tomorrow, we'll, we'll try to be limited tonight. However, tomorrow we're going we're gonna to really dive in. So what we'll do is we'll keep it, I want to say surface, but nothing surface, right? I want to say we're going to keep it surface, but nothing surface. And it's going to be a good time. So the whole thing about these couple of days is going to be taking you off of do not disturb. And it's not going to be that now God speaks to me. Now I have this greater re revelation of my insight with God. That's not the case. What it's going to be is that now your phone is no longer on do not disturb. So when the notifications come in, they're there. You can choose to see them or you can choose to not see them. The way God expects it is that no man will ever be able to say, man, I never heard God. God said, man, I spoke to you plenty of ways, right? I spoke to you this way. I spoke to you that way. I spoke to you this way. I spoke to you that way. And what we're going to do is I'm going to spend a little bit of time each day sharing things that God has done with me. And the reason I'm going to share what God has done with me is because with a testimony, you can literally encounter God based upon what another man has experienced. Okay? Now I'm explaining that to you. We say today, he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Right? You heard that before? Yeah, everybody, he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's popular. However, every man, Abraham encountered him, but Isaac encountered him based upon Abraham's experience. You see that? Without Abraham, Isaac doesn't know how to sacrifice. Without Abraham, Isaac doesn't know how to dream. Without Abraham, Isaac doesn't know how to daydream. You see, the, uh, we're going to go there when we start talking about dreams, daydreaming and nightdreaming. Isaac understood how to daydream because of his father. Isaac understood how to sacrifice because of his father. Isaac understood how to function because of his father. When we look at Jacob, Jacob understood spiritual wisdom because of what his father had. You understand? So when you look at the life of Jacob, although he was deceived by Laban, Jacob overcame Laban. The reason he overcame is because he had a different grace of wisdom. So what happens? Laban tries to take advantage of him for those who don't know. Laban tries to take advantage of him, says, you will work for me this many years, so forth and so on. However, Laban deceiving Jacob, Jacob has the upper hand because he has the wisdom from God. What Laban doesn't understand is that the angels that were with his father are now with him. But Laban can't see them. Right? So it's kind of like I tell Pepe, I may look alone, but I'm not alone. That makes sense? It may look like we're alone, but we're not. Now, Jacob took that wisdom, and then he overcame. And by the time he leaves, he has more cattle, he has more livestock, and he leaves prospered. But that's because of his father. And that's the way unlocking the voice of God works, where if a man lends you his testimony, you can grab a hold of it and then encounter God in the same measure. That's the part most people, excuse me, fail to realize. So I don't do really well with opening the Bible. Hey, let's turn here, let's turn there, let's turn there, let's turn there. So I will, by the time you're done, you'll realize, man, he went through a hundred scriptures. Although I didn't say, hey, turn here, turn there. I'm going to go through some scriptures, but only for belief's sake. Not, I know you believe me, but for others, right? Because without it, they won't believe. However, how does faith come? Hearing. hearing, right? But what do you have to hear? Yeah. So I'm going to teach you a little bit. When it says, well, how, how does it go? All right. So faith comes by hearing. And hearing comes by the word of God. What does that mean? I'll tell you. Faith comes by hearing, comma. And hearing comes by the word of God. That's Romans 10. When it says that faith comes by hearing, it means that the person who has heard God, faith comes to them. You see the difference? We make it, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We sandwich it all together. And the moment we sandwich it all together, we miss what God was trying to deliver to us. Faith comes by hearing comma. Faith has already came. You see that? 
We make it that we make it like faith comes by hearing the word of God. If it was about hearing the word of God, Satan would believe because he had all the scriptures when he when he took to tempt Jesus. Hey, throw yourself down. Do this. Do this. He's rattling off scriptures. If faith came by hearing the scriptures, the word of God, Satan would be saved. So it's obvious that the word of God isn't what produces faith. Now, I know that's that's rattling some minds because the religious doctrine that you've been preaching is faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It does kind of. Faith comes by hearing. The man who has heard God, faith comes to him. And in addition to that, hearing by the word of God. That second part means the ability to continually hear comes by the word of God. You understand? So faith comes by hearing. The man who has heard God, faith can come to him. And the ability to continually hear comes by the word of God. So I'm going to give you different keys throughout the couple of days like, hey, you can fast to hear God. You can pray to hear God. You can meditate to hear God. You can read the word to hear God. But you need to know it all starts with hearing God. So when we say unlock his voice, someone said, well, what is he in the prison? I said, well, no, dummy. <laughs> what it is, is that he's speaking and your phone is on do not disturb. That's all it is. <clears throat> and God's desire is to communicate with us. That's his whole purpose, his whole plan. God's not a deadbeat, right? So we make him out to be one. We make him out as though he's a deadbeat, so forth and so on. But God's desire is to fellowship with us. His desire is to commune with us. His desire is to move into oneness with us. You understand? So when I say, excuse me, they couldn't have been in the chat already. <laughs> when I say, hey, when a man lends his testimony to you, you have the opportunity to encounter God. What I'm saying is that when a man shares what he has experienced, there's a presence that goes along with it. What does that mean? Every man of God has unique grace that is with them. So <clears throat> what God gives me is totally different from what he gives you. Totally different. Totally different if I went through the whole room, right? Every one of us as men and women of God have something uniquely different crafted for us. Some of us, it may look a more, little more similar, right? So that's why I could say things like, oh, man, that sounds like this or this and vice versa. Similar, but totally different. Totally, totally, totally different. So every time you encounter a man of God, you have a chance to move into a new atmosphere. But most times we just take it and just listen. Oh, that's good. That's nice. That's cute. But there's more than meets the eye. Every time you hear a man of God, you have the opportunity to encounter a new atmosphere. So how does it work? Moses says, Father, I'm tired. These people, they're bearing me down. I'm weighed down. I'm tired. This is Numbers 11. I told you we're on a lot of scriptures, but I don't want to. I don't want to take our time having to read, 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 read. So with Numbers 11, Moses is literally worn down. He's worn down because the people wearing him out. And then God says, "Okay, well this is what we'll do. First of all, Moses threatened him and said, "Just kill me, and then we don't have to worry about this." And God says, "No, rather than kill you, this is what I'll do." So God had to care tremendously about him because he could have easily got rid of him. And he chose not to. He said, this is what I do. I'm going to take of the spirit that's upon you, and I'm going to place it upon 70 elders. When I place it upon the 70 elders, they will rule and serve along with you. Right? When his spirit gets placed upon the 70 elders, he says, hey, not only am I going to place my spirit upon the 70 elders, after I place my spirit upon them, I'm going to kill everybody who complained about the food. This is how God is. God's like, I'm going to bless you while I'm going to deal with everybody else also at the same time. He's telling him, hey, I'm going to put my spirit upon these 70 elders, but as soon as I'm done, I'm going to let fish and quail, all this, I'm going to bury everybody till they, till they overflowing out their nostrils with this stuff. He puts his spirit upon them, upon the 70. After he puts his spirit upon the 70, it says that there's two men that are left inside the camp. These two men that are left inside of the camp begin to prophesy. The reason they prophesied is because they came in contact with another man's atmosphere. It wasn't for them to receive of what the other 70 received. God planned that those men weren't going to get it. He said, you choose 70, that's who I'm giving it to. 
However, two men bumped into an atmosphere, bumped into a man's grace, and all of a sudden they're inside of the camp and they can now prophesy. You understand? So literally, when I say I'm going to share testimonies, I'm going to share about the angels that visited me this morning. I'm going to share about different encounters I've had. And now you have an opportunity to bump into grace like those other two men. Does that make sense? So when I say every man carries atmosphere, that's what I'm saying. When we look at Saul, King Saul. Saul, do you think you have a, do me a favor, make me like three of these. That way you won't have to get back up. Why she making me that? Let's look in the chat, see what they're saying real quick. Hello, I'm new to the stream. Would you say that God doesn't know of desire and that is more of a man-made concept? No, God knows desire because he says he will give us the desires of heart, right? We think that means that he gives us what we want. No, he places the desire inside of us. God will give us the desires of our heart. The thing I desire inside my heart is because he placed it there, right? The thing I desire is in my heart because he put it there. So God understands desire. That's the, um, I'm not sure how you say your name, but that's your, that's your answer. <laughs> the OGs are in the building, amen. <laughs> you could just fill them up without ice, that's fine. You could just fill them, just fill them up without ice. So when I say every man of God has an atmosphere, look at Saul. Saul encounters Samuel, our father, the prophet. When he encounters Samuel, Saul ain't prophesied a day in his life. Not only has he not prophesied, he ain't got a prophetic bone in his body, right? It's one thing to be a prophet. It's another thing to be prophetic. They're two different things, right? Two different things. So when you look at our father Abraham, we don't have one record of him prophesying. You can't, now I'm not saying he didn't do it because I can show you other things separate from that. But scripturally, we don't have one written account of Abraham prophesying. Yet, when God went and spoke to Abimelech, he said, why would you take this man's wife seeing as though he's a prophet? So we don't have one account of prophetic ministry from Abraham, yet he's accounted for as a prophet. So when we say prophets and prophetic people, they're two different things. But I don't always want us to think that just because somebody's prophetic, they're a prophet, or just because somebody's a prophet, they're prophetic, right? Two different things, although the words are similar. Does that make sense? Just like the seers. So we sandwich the seer with the prophet as though they're the same thing when they're two separate different things. Does that make sense? It says that Gad was the seer, Edo was the prophet. It says that we went up to see Samuel, the seer, who is a prophet. That's what they said, right? We went up to see Samuel the seer, who is a prophet. Now, when you talk about unlocking the voice of God, if you understand the seer, the prophet only deals with what he speaks. Even if he sees something, he still has to speak it. Even if he hears something, he still has to speak it. Even if he receives inspiration, he still has to speak it. However, the seer, on the other hand, deals with all of the senses. You see? So it says that, I will cover the mouth of the seer, of the prophet, but I will cover the entire head of the seer. The reason he has to cover the heads of the seer is because the seer doesn't only speak, but he sees. He doesn't only see, but he hears. He doesn't only hear, but he tastes. His entire being is prophetic. The entire thing, right? So if you shut off one avenue, he has another one. If you cut that one off, he has another one. If you cut that one off, he has another one. That's why God says, when I put you on the judgment, I'm going to cover all your seers' heads. That way I can cut them off completely. Okay? So giving you understanding so that way, and this is a school of prophets, but that was, we start talking about prophetic stuff tomorrow, we won't have to backtrack through seers and prophets and, and all those kind of dynamics. But when I say every man has a chance to encounter grace, that's what happened with Saul. He encounters the prophet, but he ain't got a prophetic bone in his body. Yet, he sits down with them, he eats with them, he fellowships with them, and then he sends them on his way. 
He says, matter of fact, send your servant ahead. You stay back with me. This is where Saul is making sure he, Samuel's making sure he has everything he needs. When he encounters the prophets, all of a sudden it says, man, this man has turned into a different man. And he began to prophesy. What happened? He encountered another man's atmosphere. First, he encountered Samuel's atmosphere. Then when he bumped into the school of prophets, he enc- well, excuse me, not the school of prophets, but when he bumped into the group of prophets, he encountered their atmosphere. And what happened? After he encountered their atmosphere, he left a different man. So you can encounter grace and it changed you and you go back to where you got sent you or where you came from receiving that, right? So some people receive it in the moment and then when they leave the atmosphere, it's like, man, it ain't there no more. God's desire is that you could tap into an atmosphere and then you carry that with you where you go. You understand? So that's, we understand it with Samuel because, with Saul, because when he left the group of prophets, Saul could still hear God. Saul knew how to dream. Saul knew how to prophesy. Saul knew how to use the Urim and Thurim. He, he knew, he was deep. He was, Saul was different. Most people don't give him enough credit, right? They treat Saul like he fell and then he just went to hell. Saul was different, right? We, we don't give the man of God enough credit. That's because we don't understand mercy, though. We don't understand mercy, so we, we just discount him because of his fall. Now, no man should rebel against God, so that's not what I'm saying either, right? Now, when Samuel cut him off, it says that he tried to dream a dream. When it says that he tried to dream a dream, we're going to talk about dreams tomorrow. Him dreaming a dream is totally different from when you lay down and you dream, right? When it says that a man dreams a dream, this man understands the prophetic doctrine necessary to make himself be in a certain position where God will come visit him when he sleeps. Two different things. When we lay down, it's just like whatever comes to us, we say our little, our little prayer and just whatever happens, <laughs> the hope and a wish, right? You just, you believe in God. You believe in God. However, dreaming a dream is something totally different. And like I said, that's more School of Prophet stuff, but I'm going to talk about dreams tomorrow. And we're hopefully with God's grace, we're going to unlock some people into that. Definitely the people who are here, but online I can't <laughs> make any promises for you. So I say, say that to say, when you encounter a man, that's what can unlock you. It isn't that we have to go through. I told you before, I could talk about Dr. Seuss for all I care. Grace is grace. And when you share it, it allows people to come into it. Amen? Excellent. So what I want to do is I want to build a case so our faith is built. And then we're going to talk about the different people God speaks to, how he speaks. And then we'll probably, just because the way things went, I wasn't going to talk about this till tomorrow. But I think we'll end the night talking. We'll start talking to end the night about meditation. Right. Meditation is something that's deeply misunderstood. Because meditation isn't that you sit there, you just hum, right? That's called chanting. We don't do that. <laughs> right? However, a spiritual man who understands God understands meditation in a way deeper way than just mumbling scriptures. That's a part two. But meditation is much deeper, and it's one of the most purest ways that a man can encounter God. So when we talk about unlocking the voice of God, meditation is one of the sure ways that can push you right into having an encounter with God. So we'll end the night there, and then tomorrow we'll kind of pick up going through the hows. How does God speak through the prophets? How does God speak through dreams? How does he speak through visions, right? Because even visions, most people don't understand them, right? You think vision is vision, but most people don't know what vision is. So when they say open vision, closed vision, most people think the closed vision is because my eyes were closed and the open vision because my eyes were open. And that couldn't be further from the truth. And open vision means that the spiritual world is open to you overlaid on top of the natural realm. That's an open vision that the spiritual realm is more closer than one, it's more closer than what we realize. So remember I said, hey man, I stand alone, but I don't walk alone, right? The spiritual realm is more closer than what we realize. You guys will get the experience when I pray for you tomorrow. It's more closer than what we realize. That's an open vision, when the two get laid right on top of each other. A closed vision is where, in the midst of this tangible presence, all that wipes out and now we're amongst the spiritual world while we're not asleep. But you can go to visions while you sleep also. This thing is deep, so that's why we're going to talk about visions, dreams, open visions, closed visions, trances, the whole nine, okay? Excellent. So let's go to, um, this is so we can say we open the Bible. I'm just choosing the scripture. So that way they won't say he never opened the scriptures once. 
So let's go, where we want to go, John? Let's go, um, <laughs> so I normally, John will tell you, typically, before I teach, I ask him, literally right before they say we're going to go live, I say, hey, man, what do I say? Hey, man, tell me where this is at, this is at, this is at, this is at. Only for everyone else, because I know the people that are with me believe me already. That's for everyone else. Right. So we're going to open a few scriptures just for the, so no one says we didn't open the Bible. Hey, Amen. So let's go to, um, let's go to Genesis 3. Let's do that. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Somebody say, y'all ain't leaving me out. <laughs> Tyree Kennedy Zoom is it working. I apologize. Please forgive us. I will continue to apologize. But after tomorrow, y'all better forgive and move on. <laughs> All right? It's my duty to apologize tonight. After tomorrow, I don't want to hear about this again. <laughs> All, right. All right? Amen. <laughs> John, let's do this. Read Genesis 3, 14 through 15 for me, please. Mm -hmm. That way we could, that we could say we read something. <laughs> let's do Genesis 3, 14 through 15. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put intimacy between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. And he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Perfect. Now that was just so we could say we read something. All right. Now back to what I was saying, another man's testimony <laughs> and receiving grace, all right? So, but I, <laughs> that was so we could just say, hey, we read something. Like he was ready to take the nose and everything. <laughs> no, but seriously, when I say when you encounter men of God, this isn't for myself, I'm teaching you how to interact with men of God and women of God. When you encounter them, you have the ability to receive from their experience. Based upon where they are, they can bring you into things that you wouldn't experience on your own. So typically, everyone who hangs out with me long enough reads the scriptures totally different from what they did prior to they met me. Everyone who hangs out with me long enough begins to have visions. Everyone who hangs out with me long enough begins to have dreams. Everyone who hangs out with me long enough begins to hear God. And they all hear God, but meaning they begin to hear him in a way that they did not understand before, interact with before, Amen. So when Jesus took the disciples up onto the mountain, this is Matthew 17. And if, you, if you're not aware with it, just raise your hand and then we'll go read it because we're not trying to leave anybody out. But for the sake of context, it's Matthew 17. When Jesus takes the disciples up on top of the mountaintop, this is the three. So remember Jesus had 12, he had 70, he had 120. Jesus had a lot more than just the few that were with him. But he dealt with every group differently according to where they were. According to where they were. Every group he dealt with differently. So what does that mean? God will deal with you differently based upon where he has you. Now, where he has you is where he wants you to be. Okay? So even as we talk about different things, when we start getting to talking about trances, dreaming dreams and all of that, I want you to understand that no man should ever seek encounters. They should seek the Lord God. However, as I share these things, desire will be placed into your heart and you can approach God as a child. Father, I would like to know you in this way. Others have experienced this and I know that you're no respective persons. Would you consider doing this for me? Right. I'm teaching you how to interact with God in a genuine way, not a religious, just fake prayer. I'm teaching you how to really interact with God. If you did that for him, would you consider doing that for me? I believe it may even help me serve you better. I would like to know you in that way. 
You know, what did Mike Epps say? I'm trying to see what that be like. <laughs> I ain't never had that happen to me. Goodness gracious. <laughs> what it means, I got that. Ain't it right? <laughs> so when you consider, though, you've never had that happen to you, and God isn't upset by your questions. God is not intimidated by your questions. I tell my wife that all the time. God's not intimidated by your questions. God's willing to interact with you based upon your questions. And I can tell you, a lot of my interactions that I'm going to share with you tomorrow were based upon me asking God questions. When I ask God, hey, I'll tell you all that question just in this group tomorrow privately. But I asked God a certain question about Elijah. That question led me to a certain encounter with a certain angel. But if I never ask him the question, I never get the answer. You see what I'm saying? But I ask him genuinely, not in a religious way, like, what, what was that like? I would like to know. Right? And God brings it by this way. So I said to say, God has you where he has you. However, it's God's desire for you to seek him out. It said that God shrouds himself in darkness, yet he dwells in unapproachable light. So which one is it? Is he in darkness or is he in light? But the part we don't understand, to God, light and dark are all the same, right? To God, it's a spectrum. It's not that one is opposing the other. It's not, it's not the same like Genesis 1 and 3, where he saw light was good and dark was evil. It's not the same. To God, light and dark is on the same spectrum. It just matters what degree you function with God at. Do you function in the dark realm or do you function in the light, right? It says that he speaks to us in dark riddles and speeches. What does that mean? It means that God is a mystery. But if you don't know how to search him out, if you don't know how to truly genuinely interact with him, you never get the answer to those mysteries. Amen? He said he spoke to Moses open face, plainly like he would speak to a friend. So Moses dealt with him on a different part of that spectrum. However, when we look at the life of prophet Samuel, this is the father of the prophets. And God was telling him things and he wasn't even giving him all of the information. So when he talks to, when it comes to unlocking the voice of God, one of the keys is learning to do the first thing that he tells you. If a man is willing to do the first thing that God tells him, God will give him more. Right? Literally, if a man is willing to take the first step, God will begin to deal with him in visions. God will begin to deal with him in the discerning. I'm showing you how to enter multiple realms or multiple paths because God has avenues by which he speaks discernment, the inner man, dreams, visions, prophet. there's different paths and avenues by which he speaks. And all you got to do is master one. If you master one, your relationship with Jesus will, and then everything else becomes accessory to it. Does that make sense? Everything else becomes accessory to it. But all you got to do is master one. But in mastering any path, it starts with being obedient. It starts with being obedient. So he tells our father Abraham, Abraham, I'm calling you out from the Chaldeans, from the land of Ur. I'm sending you to a land that I will show you. And then Abraham began his journey. But what's the problem? Abraham didn't know where he was going. Right? He says, I'm sending you to a land that I will show you, not sending to you a land that I've shown you. You see the difference? I'm sending you somewhere and you don't even know where you're going. But all of a sudden, Abraham eventually begins to move. And as he moves, he finds himself in a clash collision with God, moving in a direction of God. So if you want to see, you have to be obedient. OK, that's for that's for those who are the household of faith. I can't speak for everybody else. But for those of us who believe in the name of God, our first step is obedience. Right. So God has you where he has you. Now, taking that back to Peter, James and John, when Jesus takes them up upon the mountaintop. It says that he goes upon a mountaintop, they fall asleep. This is the Mount Transfiguration story, right? Everybody knows it. Does everybody know it? Right, everybody knows it. Jesus takes them upon the mountaintop, and while he's up there, it says that they fall asleep. When they wake up, they see Moses and Elijah. Jesus transfigured into the light of who he truly is, fully venting his light. When they see Moses and Elijah, he said, Master, it's good for us to be here. Do you want us to build tents for everybody? Right? And then the experience is over. They begin a journey back down the mountaintop. Jesus then tells them, do not share this with any of your brothers until I have risen. 
So God will allow you to experience things and you have to know, is this for me to keep my mouth shut or is this for me to share with his people? Okay? Because if you're someone that doesn't know to discern how to discern the difference, God won't deal with you in that way. God will deal with you in the shadows. But if you want to deal with him in the light, you have to know, is this something that God wants me to share with his people or is this something that's for me? And a lot of things that God gives us are to, for us to hold close and dear to the chest. And in holding them close and dear to the chest, they empower us for our service to him. Everything is about our relationship to him. And if we're going to have a relationship with, relationship with him, it requires our service to him. Amen? Amen? Excellent. So when you talk about encountering grace, Jesus didn't even pray for their eyes to be opened. They experienced Moses and Elijah by virtue of being in his atmosphere. He didn't pray. Paul said, what? Father, I pray that you open their eyes that they may, that their, their eyes of their enlightenment may, that their eyes of the enlightenment may be open, that they may have understanding in their enemy. He prayed that whole prayer. Jesus didn't pray one prayer. He said, y'all just come with me. Watch what happens. Right? So when you encounter a man of God, you have the opportunity to bring, come into things that aren't even necessary to pray for. Right? And then there's other times where there's opportunities where you will pray for individuals and bring them into it also, like Elijah and Elisha. Father, I pray that you open his eyes that he, everyone knows that, right? Open his eyes that he can see there's more to with them. His eyes were open based upon another man's sight. So what he could see, he wanted him to experience. When he prayed for him, he got to experience it also. That's what Jesus did. Father, I pray that you make them one like you and I are one. What he was bringing us into his relationship with the Father. Amen? Bringing us into his oneness. So we talk about unlocking the voice of God as many ways that it happens. Okay? Excellent. So now when we talk about it's one down. <laughs> when we talk about who does God speak to, I want to build the narrative of everyone that he speaks to that's not like us. So by the time we build this narrative, we'll know that God, if he could speak to them, surely he's one to want to speak to me. Okay? <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> right? That's the confidence factor. If God is willing to deal with this individual who despises his ways, hates his son, I love his son, and I delight in his ways, how much more so would he be willing to interact with me? How much more so? I'm teaching you how to interact with God. Father, you did it for him. How much more so? I'm trying. Right? So Genesis 3, what he read at 14 through 15, it says that the Lord spoke to Satan. So let's just start at the top. If he can speak to Satan... <laughs> <laughs> or should we say the bottom? <laughs> right? I don't know where the chat went. Hold on. There we go. Can you explain encounters versus seeking God? Yes. An encounter is what God brings upon you. You seeking God is you looking to fellowship with him. They're two different things. Two different things. When, an, when you encounter an angel, you're encountering God, but you weren't seeking God. You see the difference? Every angel that spoke to me spoken to me on his behalf. Angels speak on his behalf, not on their own accord. So angels aren't to be sought. They're messengers. Angels are looking at your life, peering in, wanting to learn more. So it's not that you seek encounter. So you don't go up to your rooftop and try to fall into a trance like Peter, right? So people see that Peter was on a rooftop and he went into a trance. No, Peter was praying. And as he was praying, he went into a trance. That's something God brought upon him. It wasn't that he went on a rooftop and said, let me get a bowl and start striking it and doing some stuff to try to put myself into a certain state. You see the difference? So it's not that we seek encounters, we seek him. He alone is more than enough. This is what I always tell people. Always seek the Lord Jesus and he will reveal the Father to us. Jesus said that I come and I knock at your door. If any man opens, I will bring my Father with me and we will come in and dine and fellowship with you. That means that there's a meal that you can have with him. There's a conversation that you can have with the Father and the Son together. Right? But that comes by him knocking at your door. Not you going up on your rooftop trying to fall into a trance. <laughs> right? 
right? People try to, so even, I'm gonna teach you about meditation, people try to put themselves into a certain state and then they find themselves teetering the lines between falling into witchcraft. Because I can tell you now, and I've said it, the lines between witchcraft and the prophetic are so thin, it's, it's scary. I'm talking ever so thin, it's scary. And if a man doesn't know God, he could easily fall to the wrong side of that thing. That's why you gotta be connected to the right people so you don't get led astray. Amen? Excellent. But so now we know God is willing to speak to Satan. So if God is willing to speak to Satan, how much more so for every other person, right? So God spoke to Satan. Now, give me Genesis 5 when he deals with Cain. Amen. Tyree Kennedy says, surely he will speak to me then. That's right. Somebody said, Jehovah Jireh, Jesus is enough. I'm gonna challenge you on that. Jehovah Jireh was somebody else's name for God. What is your name for God? We call him Jehovah Jireh based upon another man's experience. What is your experience that you named him? So when we talk about unlocking the voice of God, one of the reasons that you haven't had continual interaction with him is because when he did the miraculous thing for me, you moved on from it. And you didn't mark a memorial there that, Father, this is where I met you. I'm anointing this place, and now I have an altar with you. You understand? So when I say, hey, bring the oils, I have an altar. All I got to do is bring my altar. That altar is here. But it's different for every man. Jacob encounters him. When he encounters him, he says, surely this is the gate of heaven. And what happened? That president went with him from there. Everywhere. It was unlocked, right? So somebody said, that, that's not a diss, because the chat didn't, I fell out my chair. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Grab your wig while you're back there. <laughs> said, man, you're teaching. We're just getting started. You're, you're going to be sick by the end of the night. I promise. So literally, we call him Jehovah Jireh. Uh, uh, based upon somebody else's encounter. But the point was that we would know his encounter to know that, God, surely you can do that for me. And when he does that for me, I can say, God, you're the one who didn't abandon me when everyone else did. You're the one that provided when all of my mistakes brought me to that place. That's how I know God. You're the one when my negligence put my family in trouble, you delivered me. You're the God who protects the foolish. That's my name for him, right? You're the God who protects the foolish. So what happens? He likes to interact with me because I have a name for him. Yeah. He's given me a name, I've given him a name, and we just, you know, we got his love thing going. <laughs> right? People don't know, J Jesus is going to name you in the new life to come. You don't even know that. Shar won't be Shar. Shar will be Shar, but to Jesus, Shar will be something totally different that only the two of you know. That's a love fling. You see the difference? That's an interaction. That name that she has for me is totally different from what she calls you or what she calls you. You call him honey bear boob, whatever that name I be seeing on your phone, Papa Bear, right? <laughs> I be seeing it when you're next to him in the little FaceTime, I say, oh, okay, right? It's deep, it's, it's beautiful. I say, oh. I know what they're doing. <laughs> right? You call him that, but I call him John. You see the difference? The level of interaction that you have with him based upon what you named him determines how you interact with one another. But you're still running around here, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Shalom. No, he's the God of peace. You saw everything was going haywire, and I was just like, hey, God, just kind of be with us. Just tear my wife's nerves up. <laughs> My wife's like, you need to care more. <laughs> Why? He's my God of peace. It's not a cliche. It's there. It's there in, in this period. Now, we obviously got to fix things, and we're going to make things right. And adjust. That's not an excuse. But the man who can be unhindered in his inner man can hear God through the midst of anything. Right? So when we talk about unlocking the voice of God, this is even where I was going. But the man who's stable in his soul, secure in his inner man, 
the man who has what I call a quiet spirit. Everyone call every prophet, every man God has different ways they talk about this. I like to talk about the man who has a calm soul and a quiet spirit. Everyone will call it different things. But the man who has himself collected or has a calm soul and a quiet spirit, he can hear him in the midst of anything. You understand? Literally, Literally in the midst of anything. When you look at Abraham, he tells him, I want you to take him up onto this mountain and there you're going to sacrifice him. Everyone knows that story, right? Good. I would hope so, so we ain't got to read all of that. <laughs> so everyone knows that. He says, I want you to go and sacrifice your only son. Now, y'all have heard me teach about this before. He had another son, but God didn't even consider him in the equation. God said, what you produce in your own strength doesn't count. So Ishmael, he out of here. Now, Isaac, that's what I want. Give him to me. When he says, give him to me, then Abraham begins his journey, says, I and the lad will return, but we are going to go worship. So the first thing is he understood that God will either raise him up or he will give me another one. He knew from the jump, God will either raise him up or he's going to give me another one. Because remember, God had already shown him, your descendants will be like the stars, like the sand, so forth and so on. Surely God's not a man that he would lie, right? He takes him up on that journey, then ties him down. And Isaac got all kind of deep trauma because <laughs> this man got bound up to the altar. He's like, I hate it here. <laughs> you imagine that, hey, this is what God wants, son. <laughs> he learned to interact with God, though, the God of his father. So there would be nothing too hard that God would ever be able to ask from Isaac because Isaac was laid on that altar. You see that? The man who is given everything will always demand everything from everybody else. So there's nothing Isaac won't do based upon what he experienced. That's why we don't give cheap grace and cheap gospel. Why? It costs me everything. It has to cost you everything also. Now, it may take you longer to empty your wallet than some others, but it has to cost you everything. Right? Jesus will extract your life up out of you, though. Just give him long enough. <laughs> Just give him long enough. He was talking, okay, I was like, give me your time. All right. Give me your money. Okay, give me your relationships. Right? Next thing you know, you stand, give him everything. But he's totally worth it anyway. So he has him on this altar, and then he says, kill your only son. Most of us, we know we can't bring ourselves to that place. Now, the key is that the man who possesses a calm spirit, a quiet spirit, has the ability to hear God in the midst of turmoil. So then what happens? It says, help, help me, I will, help find the, pull that up for me. We will read this so that way <laughs> niggas don't say we making stuff up. <laughs> wow, this is what I've been praying for, for a quiet spirit and a gentle soul. Amen. That saying is moving too fast. These nuggets are good. Well, y'all better keep commenting, liking, and sharing, or we'll, we'll cut this suck off. <laughs> He's pulling it up. Give him a second. You're a real one, bro. God did it. All right, Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter, yes. I want you to go to where he lays him in the altar and he's about to strike him. Okay. Then they came to a place of yes. which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Keep going. Yep, I'm looking for a certain part. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand, hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your no son, son your only son, from me. Perfect. Now, what you read New King James? Yes. What you, what you got, King James? Can you, I'm looking for a certain, for it a certain way. Yes. 
Yeah, just for, um, I'm looking for when the angel, right before the angel calls out to him. Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know thou fearest God. Yep. Seeing thou hast not even feared thy son. Yes. All right. Hold on one second. I'm looking for something. All right. Now I want you to, John. I want you to skip down to actually go twelve through fifteen. That's what I'm looking for. Okay. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Then Abraham lifted up, lifted his eyes and looked. And there behind him was a ram caught in the thickest by its horn. All right, now I'm going to show you something real quick. We're going to keep going, but I'm going to show you something. Remember I told you obedience will allow you to see, right? God told Abraham what? Go to a land that I will show you. Not that you've already seen. Go to a land I will show you. When he begins to walk toward the land that God will show him, he begins to see. Okay, take the next step. Okay, all right, this is, take the next step. Take the next step. What do we see here? When he prepares to sacrifice his son, then the angel of the Lord calls out to him from heaven. Then he lifts his eyes and he sees a ram caught in the thicket. If he's not obedient, he never sees a ram caught in the thicket. And secondly, he didn't assume that God would take this over what he asked for, right? So what happens? We see God's asking you for this, but you say, well, well God meant like this. And then we give that to him instead. And the thing we give him proves that we don't love him. Because he said, Abraham, now I know you love me because you will give me your only son. So when God is asking us for something, he's testing our love. All right? All right, now pick up. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide. All right, y'all see that? Abraham is naming this place based upon what he has experienced with God. Abraham is obedient. As he's obedient, he now begins to see. What happened? His sight is being locked, unlocked based upon his obedience. As he now experiences the provision from God, he names this place. Father, this place right here is what we'll call this. Because this is where you and I interacted in this way. You understand? If you want to experience God, you got to go back to where you encounter and say, this place right here, this is what, this is, what, uh, what uh, Austin Powers, I shall call him my this, right? Mm -hmm. This is my name for you. You have to go back to that place and name the encounter. So now what you realize is God had moved in my life in this way, and I never even built a memorial to him. God touched me here, and all I could thought was to just, oh, you Jehovah, you the healer. No, God's more than that. He's looking, what's your name for God? All right? Go ahead. And Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day in the mountain then the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out That's of heaven. That's what I'm looking for. So now what happens? The angel of the Lord does what? Calls out to him a what? Second time. Second time. Now the question you had to ask yourself was, when was the first time God, the angel of the Lord called out to him? <laughs> I'm here for it. I'm here for it. It takes others longer to catch it. Right. He called out to him a second time. If he calls out to him a second time, this means that he's already spoken to him a first time. Okay? The first time he's speaking to him is not a few verses before when he says, Abraham, stop. All that's part of one. We read it like it's two different interactions. All that's part of one interaction. He says that, the angel of the Lord called out to him a second time. So when was the first time that he interacted with the angel? 
I'll give you a second. YouTube got their thinking caps on. Wow, 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 wow. Wow, Oh, don't worry, Brianna. We'll we'll go to that. We'll get to that tomorrow. And the all time speaking of isn't that you go build wood and build an altar. So just slow down. <laughs> I Remember, I told you the lines between the and witchcraft are very thin. If somebody doesn't dare direct you, you'll get yourself in trouble. So, so don't go to Home Depot tomorrow. Just, <laughs> just wait on God. <laughs> but the angel Lord called out to him a second time. The first time the angel Lord called out to him was the angel Lord said. Go kill your son. We think it's that he had an encounter with God and God said, Abraham, I want you to give me your only son. He had an encounter with God, but it was by virtue of the angel. The angel Lord called out to him a second time. The first time was, I want you to go prepare your son, give him to me. Now, here's the thing. Most people, they speak against these things because they don't know. And this is what I will say. And you've always heard me say this, but for those of you all who are new, right? And for those who are gonna be catching this, who were stuck on Zoom, if, I don't wanna say this so we don't offend nobody. That way they make it to the next day. But, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not gonna say it the way I was gonna say it. However, throw away what you think you know. Take what you think, not what I said you know, what you think you know. Right? Most people think they know the first time he called it to them. Throw away what you think you know. That way you can receive greater light. Okay? Now, I didn't say take away which is sure, which is of the foundations, which are of the faith, and throw them away. I said throw away what you think you know. Because we're going to be talking about spiritual things. And the guarantee is when God gives certain men certain things, everyone connected to them doesn't have it. The reason they don't have it so God can use me to give it to you. So then all the people that you can reach that I can't reach, you can give it to them. That's the whole point. So everybody with you will not know that the angel of the Lord called out to them at first time. But you're going to one day be able to explain to them that, no, the angel of the Lord called out to them a first time. And that first time was, give me your son. Okay? So take, away what, you, take what you think you know and just chuck that to the garbage. That way you can receive. So the angel of the Lord called out to them a first time. Anytime we deal with angels, and this is in the school of angels, this is in the school of prophet, but we're going to be talking about angels. Anytime we deal with the angelic realm, anytime we deal with the ministering spirits that are before God, they never speak on their own accord. Never. Anytime, I'll trip you out, anytime you have angels that are in pairs or in groups, they speak in unison. They don't speak, like let's say you and I, we go together, we're about to have lunch with someone, but we're going to deliver a message to them. We might all say it differently. No, when angels speak, they sit down at one time and all say the same thing. And I'll trip you out even further. You may hear one voice, one mouth move and three voices. It's different. It's nothing like what we understand by our world, right? Literally. So when he says that the angel Lord called out to him a second time, that's because there was a first time. And what does the angel of the Lord then say? He calls out to him and says, now I know that you love me. The angel of the Lord is speaking on behalf of God. God is proxying through the angel. Now I know you love me. The angel isn't proclaiming that he loves him. The angel is literally standing there on behalf of God. Now I know that you love me because you will not withhold your only son from me. Angels don't get to demand sacrifices. Angels will never demand sacrifices. However, God will but God will use his servants to do it, right? Most of us don't encounter them because we don't understand the ways of God. You understand? So the angel Lord called out to him a second time. That's because there was a first time. Amen? So you got to take what you think you know, just chuck that to the side, and just keep your heart open there. Father, you can speak to me anywhere. Just like with Balaam. The donkey starts speaking. He didn't even understand. He, he was willing to have a full-blown conversation with the donkey until he realized, oh, shoot, wait a minute, God is speaking to me, right? The extent of God's reach is well beyond what we understand. The extent of God's reach. He says, hey, don't you knock? I'll make these rocks praise me. Why? Because they got a mouth somehow. We can't see it, 
but he can fashion it in such a way that it will proclaim his name. He can fashion it in such a way that it will proclaim and sing his praises. Why? He's deeper than what we understand. God's ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. That's why I say take what you think you know and throw it in the garbage. Why? Because his thoughts aren't your thoughts. And if you're willing to, Father, I want your mind, right? Let this mind, which is in him, be also in me. Father, bring me into oneness that I may think as you think, that I may move as you move, that you and I could be one together, right? Just as the angels move in unison, Father, I want to move with you in that same manner. I want to move lock, pace, foot, and step with you. Amen? Excellent. So now let's, let's go on. So we know God spoke to Satan. Now God spoke to Adam. So Adam falls, and then he tells Adam, Adam, where you at? What you doing? Why'd you do this? So God's willing to also speak to Adam. Then we see God willing to speak to his son, Cain. Cain murders his brother. Not only does he murder him, God tries to warn him beforehand. Like, hey, sin is creeping at your door. Don't allow this to enter you. Now, if you understand the door, the door represents the heart of a man, the spirit of a man. Sin is knocking at your door. So Jesus says on the flip side, what? I am knocking at your door also. The question is, who can you hear knocking and who are you going to let in? He says, sin is knocking at your door. <laughs> Y'all hold on. Let me check some of these chats real quick. New subscriber. God bless you. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to keep it up and email it out to everybody. I'm hard-headed by nature. There's been a few times where God has told me something four or five times before I get it. And other times, he's had to allow some things to happen to sit me down and get my attention. Well, I guess you like to learn our way. <laughs> I would have been creeped out if a donkey started talking. To, I mean, I would have too. It's not that things aren't different, right? It's not that things aren't different. So I'm not saying that these things happen and you're not scared, they're not unique. But what I am saying is keep an open heart. I fell out of my chair again. Okay, we don't need you to sit on the floor. <laughs> Asia Sally said, at some point in time, can you explain open versus closed visions one more time? We're going to go through that in detail tomorrow, so you don't have to worry about that. Can you explain the mark of Cain? You're going to take us somewhere else. <laughs> but I'll, 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 I'll entertain you, Batman. So he says, I'm going to set a mark upon you. That way, no one will harm you. Now, you got to ask yourself, why would, Cain, why would God have to mark Cain if there was nobody else? Because remember the genealogy. What was the genealogy? Adam begot Cain and his brother. We don't have any other documentation of, other, other, of another people group, of another type. However, God said, listen, I'm going to put a mark upon you. When I set this mark on you, nobody's going to harm you. And I'm going to send you about it. He says, this punishment that you've given me is too much to bear. It's too much for me to bear. He said, don't worry. You will be a vagabond. You're going to roam about the earth, but nobody's going to touch you. Nobody's going to harm you. Cain knew he should be scared, and God knew Cain should be scared. So there's just, remember I said, take what you think you know, and just throw that on over there. There's more at play than when we see out. Now, I'm not going to tell you who the, other, who the other people were, but we can talk about that tomorrow. But when it says that he put a mark on his forehead, what most people don't realize, I'm just entertaining your question since you went there, is that there's a spiritual nature by which in the spirit we look totally different from how we look in the flesh. Within the spirit, you look like you, but you don't look like you. So what do I mean when I say you look like you? There's a certain likeness that looks like you, however, is different. So it's kind of the best way I could describe it. And the reason, when I'm saying the best way I could describe it is because I don't understand the words to describe it how we understand. The entire revelation he's saying is like this, is like this, is like this, is like this, because there's no words to describe it. 
We got a whole group of Hebrew Israelites talking about Jesus got wool when he said his hair was white like wool, right? That's the best thing he could use to describe it. So when he said, I'll set a mark upon you within the forehead. Now we're going to get tomorrow in the spiritual sight. And we may mute it when we start talking about the third eye, because we're going to address all of that. When we start talking about the forehead, this is one of the places in which God marks people. That's not a thing that he marked with Cain. Every one of you has a mark within your head. Every one of you have a mark within your head that has information written about you that others can see. However, that mark with your head isn't in the flesh, it's in the spirit. Right? So I remember <clears throat> I was ministering and helping someone, and they were working through this name change that they needed to do. They went to the courthouse to change a name. Because remember, within a name, the term is a purpose. What you name, you get to control. Not only do you get to control it, it determines its trajectory. So that's why Jacob had the trajectory in which he had because of his name. Jacob, you should be a supplanter. He went on doing that, and he was also deceived by virtue of his name. Moses means one who has been drawn or shall be drawn from out of the water. So what happens? His name brings about his prophetic destiny, that he too shall be drawn from out of the waters. Amen? So a name controls the thing. So this young lady changed her name. However, I didn't know her name. So then I say, I look her in the forehead, I'm like, you have an M on your forehead, and your name is this. Tell her her name. I'm not gonna say it for integrity's sake. But I tell her the M is there. What happened was she tried to change her name naturally, but spiritually it was still there. She went to the courthouse and did it. Like, this is my name. None of that mattered in the spirit. None of it mattered. When I looked at her, I'm like, no, your name is this. And the reason being, names were tied in because the husband had one name and she had one name and it was the same letter. That's how I saw the two tying together. Like, your name is this, your name, got it. Now, seeing within the spirit also requires a level of interpretation because when I saw his name, the way I understood it was Michael. However, that wasn't his name. It sounded like Michael. So that interpretation, I have to now use my function and insight to get it. You understand? And if it's detrimental, God will then have to stop me to fix it. That's what happened with Samuel. God had to stop him from anointing the wrong son. So in terms of unlocking the voice of God, it's a lot more to it than just what meets the eye. So when he asked about the mark in the forehead, do I need to back up from it? Okay. When he asked about the mark in the forehead, mark in the forehead is one of the ways that God marks people. So much so that if you, re and I'll go through this tomorrow when we start talking about how to see, but the mark within the forehead is all throughout the scriptures. And now that I've mentioned it to you, when you read Ezekiel, when you read the prophets, you're going to see it. You're going to be like, oh, shoot, it was right there all this time. All this time. I won't tell you where it's at, but just as you read it, you'll begin to see. Even in Revelation, I will put a seal within their forehead. Right? So that, I hope that answers your question. I've been battling with the significance of it. It's important, but it's not important. Don't major on the things that are minor. Let me see. I won't leave you out. We're gonna we'll talk about it. He took me off track. What were we talking about before that? He messed me up. So y'all could thank him. What's his name? Thank everybody. Thank Quentin for messing it up. <laughs> Cain. So God marks Cain. Now when we look at that, just kind of building the case. God was willing to speak to Satan. God's willing to speak to Adam. God is also willing to speak to Cain. That's what it was. What'd you say? Oh, okay. Tyree. You, that, everybody think Tyree. <laughs> so when God marked Cain, God was even willing to speak to him before he sinned. God was willing to speak to him after he sinned. We like to come up with religious stuff like God, don't, God ain't dealing with you. You a sinner. You don't know. Right, that's, that's the first thing they do. They make up their religious jargon because that's their level of understanding because they don't hear God. So then they think, oh, well, God's not willing to deal with a sinner. No, it says that he doesn't regard their prayers. Not that he doesn't speak to them. Him regarding your prayers and him speaking to you are two different things. 
two entirely different things. But we sandwich y'all all into the package of religion. Like, oh yeah, man, well, you know, God doesn't hear the sinner. No, God doesn't regard the prayers of one who regards iniquity in his heart. That's what it says. Not that he doesn't speak. God is willing to speak to keep you from falling. What does Jesus say? Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling. How's he going to keep you? By telling you, don't go this way. Right? You will hear the voice saying, this is the way, walk in it. Make sense? So God is, willing, God is trying to keep Cain before he falls and willing to set him up in a measure after he falls. Like, hey, listen, you messed up. This is what we'll do. I'm going to mark you. Now, you're going to have to suffer, but this is how we'll go about this. Okay? So then he sends him on his journey. Now, remember, the door represents the spirit of a man. That right there, that knock, what did he say? Sin is knocking at your door. It's desirous to rule over you. It's desirous to overtake you. Cain didn't even know it was there. He couldn't hear the knock. Which means that that knock that Jesus brings, he says, behold, I stand and I knock at the door. If any man would open to me, I and my father will come in and have and make our bow with him. That knock isn't like this. Because if that was the case, every man would hear it. That knock comes from within. That's why when I say having a calm spirit, having a quiet soul, this has to be regulated so you can hear. Right? So most people miss God when first when we start talking about unlocking the voice of God. Most people miss it because the first thing they go to is this, not knowing that God is here. It is from this place, the core of a man, that he begins to speak. Then that has to move his way into the soul. Then once it moves away to the soul, it has to move its way to the body, right? So you have a spirit that receives revelation. However, your soul doesn't receive revelation. So what does your soul do? Your soul gets the revelation and then it has intuition. You see that? It, intuition is the soul's version of revelation. Why? It receives something without being taught about it. It receives something that it did not have prior knowledge about. That's why I tell you revelation isn't studied, it's received, right? The soul has it, and then the body can comprehend it. Hey, man, they don't mean we will. But if the spirit can't fully hit the soul, you end up missing God. And that's what's happening for a lot of people where the soul is the intermediary between the spiritual world and the natural world. So you have the spirit that's housed inside of you. You have the spiritual world. You have the natural world. And neither one can interact unless the soul is willing to let it. You understand? Neither one can interact unless the soul is willing to oblige. If the soul isn't willing to oblige, the spirit is just shrouded and can do nothing. Now, God's original desire for, and makeup for man was that the spirit would lead us. So we end up being more body, soul, spirit when God's original design is that we would be spirit, soul, body. You understand? We see that with the life of our Lord Jesus. Jesus functioned more as what? A spirit. That's why he's walking on what it said. It's a spirit. They didn't say it's a man. They said, we were afraid because we saw a spirit coming on the water. Jesus wasn't moving in his body. So we talk about Jesus walking on water, kind of. <laughs> we diminish it. We, we reduce spiritual functions down to this carnal Sunday school understanding, right? Jesus was walking, kind of. Not quite, buddy. Jesus was moving within the spirit. Two different things. Amen? So the function of the spirit is totally different. Oh, man. I'm sorry, guys. So we'll, we'll do a few more minutes. Is everybody good? Let's check on YouTube. YouTube, let's light up the chat real quick. If y'all if act right, I'll stay on for a few more minutes. Let's see what they say. We'll get the TV working tomorrow so we can all see it. <laughs> can we be like the Africans and go all night? I'm not against it. But, Sean, Sean what do you say? Okay. <laughs> no, man, we don't have grapes tonight. So 
so we'll, we'll go for a few more minutes. But the fact was Jesus was willing to speak to all these individuals who were opposed to his ways, were rebelling against him. How much more so for you and me? God is willing to save an entire nation by speaking to a heathen, Pharaoh. How much more so for you and me? This man is opposed to God's ways. He loses the nation in the sorcery, divination, witchcraft, and all of the likes. And God still says, in order to preserve my people, I'm going to speak to him. But the difference is he don't have no understanding and they're going to have to come to us to get it. You understand? Yeah. Most of us will miss out on the opportunity for God to use us because of that. I ain't did talking to no wizard. I ain't talking to no witch. Right? <laughs> Moses was right there dealing with him. Daniel is right there amongst the house with all of them. And you and your religious self can't hear nothing, but you want to speak about every other thing. Right? But they, they accuse everybody of witchcraft and make these campaigns about every man of God but they can't hear nothing. You know, what'd you say? <laughs> they do, they're nasty, they're disrespectful, they're ugly. And just say, hey man, I would like to receive grace. Rather than taking the humble road. You, everything you don't know, you immediately ascribe to witchcraft. You immediately take what you don't know, and you say, you know what, that's witchcraft right there. Well, the fact is you don't know. And I'm telling you now, when we talk about some of these things tomorrow, you can be like, well, I never knew. <laughs> right? Elisha said, hey, get the salt so we can throw it in there. If a man of God walked up in with some salt, everyone would be like, man, that's witchcraft. Yeah. What do you do? You got to throw away what you think you know. Throw away what you think you know. Remember, his thoughts are not our thoughts, and his ways are not our ways. Amen. Okay? His ways. He will lead us into his ways. Right? So now that we know God is willing to speak to all these individuals, how much more so for you and me is God willing to speak to us? But one of the things I want us to focus on tonight is the ability to quiet one's soul, the ability to be still in the inner man. It doesn't mean that turmoil won't happen, right? It doesn't mean that chaos won't happen. You saw that with the last year. We just like, we just, we, we. you can only do what you can do. But when you have that resolve, that right there gives you the ability to walk with God. What did Daniel and, and, and the three Hebrews say, right? Mishael, Hananiah, all of them. They said, we know that our God is able to deliver us. However, even if he doesn't, O king, may you live forever. And they blessed their God. You know what they say? There's a, there's a fourth man like them in the fire. Now, the thing was, God didn't have to deliver them from the fire. And they understood that. We understand that there's a possibility you may not deliver us from this. There's a possibility. So everyone, that's the, other, that's the flip side of the coin, right? They make it like we're Christian Avengers. <laughs> right? But he said, in this life, you will have tribulation, but take heart because I have overcome it all. Not you will overcome it all. I have overcome it all. Him overcoming it gives you the ability to endure what you don't overcome. Right? Take heart because I have overcome it all, not you. So then we, we put our Christian Avengers t-shirt on and roll out here and make our little statements like we're, we're, we're numb to what the enemy can loose upon us or what God can bring upon us. Because God thought, I will bring this upon Job. What did Satan say? Take away all this stuff, he'll curse you. Take away all this stuff, he'll curse you. You know, he only loves you because you set that hedge about him. What was the hedge? All his resources. What does it say about the wealthy? They have the ability to hedge themselves by their virtue of what they have. That's what Job was talking about when he says, take the hedge away. If you take the hedge away, that man will curse you. What was his hedge? His financial stability allowed him insulation. And we know it's true naturally. If a man is well financially, if he's stable financially, by default, even without God, he can just sidestep some of the turmoil that life can bring his way. Without God. That's why money will deceive you as though it's, as if it is God. Because it can insulate you as though you're protected by God. Jesus said, take heart in this world. You will have tribulation. Take heart. I overcame it all. Not you will overcome it all. Right? You will have to endure things. To him who endures to the end, he will get this. If you have to endure something, that means you had to suffer something. Right? Now, I really want to have it as easy as possible. So, <laughs> amen. I'm not, I'm not of the, the, the doom and gloom camp, okay? 
Yeah, God chooses toughest battle for his toughest soldiers. That's not me. So, <laughs> right? That's not me. However, even if I have to endure it, blessed be the name of the Lord my God. Right? I can remember when my wife and I were going through a situation with the possibility of losing a child. The first thing I said was, no matter what happens, I'll always serve my God. Blessed be the name of the Lord my God. No matter what happens, no matter what I have to endure, no matter what I have to suffer, I will never not live for my God. Why? That sets, I set my heart in place by virtue of my spirit. So it sounded like that was my mouth speaking, but my spirit took over. No matter what happens, I will always serve my Lord and my God. Right? The spirit moved to the forefront for a moment. That's what God is looking to do. So even when David says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all all that is within me and forget not his benefits, right? That's the spirit speaking. That ain't the body speaking. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Why is he saying his soul blessing? Why? The spirit is commanding the soul what to do. Soul, you bless God and everything that's within you. The spirit came to the forefront and spoke for a moment. Amen? So when we talk about hearing God, a calm spirit is of the utmost importance. A collected spirit is of the utmost importance. That collected spirit has the ability to interact with God in ways that most cannot. And different ways we come into it. Prayer. You can just ask them. Right? It doesn't even have to be a magical formula. Father, I ask you that you give me a calm spirit. I ask you that you give me a quiet soul. I ask you that you make me low before you. God is not willing in seeing you fail. God's not willing on sending any. I always say that. God's not interested in sending anybody on a dummy mission. We send ourselves on dummy missions doing things he didn't ask us to do. But he himself, everything he's purposed us to do, he didn't, he's not interested in seeing us fall. That's why he's there to keep us from falling. Okay? So having a calm spirit and a quiet soul. Now, one of the ways that you can do this is prayer. Another way is meditation. And this is where we'll end. Not right there, but we'll end around that theme, meditation. One of the ways a man can calm his soul is through meditation. Now, the problem is, most people have no clue how to meditate. And in addition to that, remember I told you there's a very thin line between witchcraft and the things of God at times. I'm talking paper thin, razor thin. So you have to do it right, right? But meditation isn't sitting in Indian style and just chanting, um, right? Even in that, what's happening is when you see those kind of things, the ums, all that, they're trying to channel themselves to a certain frequency. The reason they're channeling themselves to a certain frequency is so that they can attract a like spirit or bring themselves into a state of ambience. That stillness can then have the ability for other spirits to speak back to them and then be able to receive it. Remember I said the phone's on do not disturb? Meditation is one of the ways you take the phone off do not disturb. Okay? Now we will open the Bible because I want to show it to you. So let's go to uh, Genesis. Okay, we had a few questions while we were going to Genesis. When you hear a voice audibly or you feel your ears open and you hear that you're in another place but you're at home, what does that mean? It could mean a number of different things. That answer, and you'll hear me say this tomorrow, but God is not cookie cutter. So what happens for one person can be totally different for another person. The way God dealt with Job was totally different from how he dealt with with Elijah, right? So Elijah came out of the cave with a still small voice, yet Job heard him speak from out of a whirlwind. So then the religious people say, oh, well, God speaks in a still small voice. Well, God can speak however he wants to, actually, right? God can speak however he wants to, whether that's a boom and a shake or whether that's within inside of the inner man. So understanding that God's not cookie cutter. So Victor and Jacqueline, it can mean a number of things. And when you hear a voice audibly, nine times out of ten, you've heard, you've heard God. And I'll teach them about the angels. But angels speak two ways. They can speak from within and without. So most times they can speak and you will hear it here, but you can also hear it separate from you. Because what did John say? I heard a voice from behind me while I was in the spirit saying, come up here. Right? Surround sound. When the audible voice of God speaks, you will hear it 
all around you and all throughout you. You understand? It won't just be that how you said it, you heard it audibly or your ears open. No, you will hear within you and all around you. You will know. Amen? Excellent. I'm looking for uh here we go. Let's go, um, John, I want you to help me read this. Let's go to Genesis 18. But before you read it, we're going to talk a little bit about meditation. And before you understand meditation, you have to learn the difference between the voice and speech. The voice and speech. So Jesus told the Pharisees, he said, why is it that you hear my voice, but you do not understand my speech? Right? Jesus told me that. Why, excuse me. Why is it that you hear my speech, but you do not understand my voice? You hear my speech, meaning you hear me audibly, but you do not understand my voice. And the reason being, what Jesus speaks is in, so you hear me. You hear me, right? You can hear me. You can hear me, right? Laced within what I'm saying, or in, my words are enveloped in spirit. Literally. They come out, but what you can't see is that they're enveloped and shrouded in spirit. Like Jesus, my words are spirit and they're life. That's why when they land upon a recipient's heart, they can bring things forth. Jesus said, my words that I speak are what? Spirit and they are life. The reason they were hearing his voice, but they could not understand is because his words are spirit. You understand? And spirit only can speak to spirit. That's why he speaks to our spirit. That's why he's given us Holy Spirit. That's even the capacity of human spirit is so we can interact with God. The entire purpose of God placing a spirit inside of us is so we have the ability to interact with him. Right? Because when we die, that spirit returns to God. That's what Ecclesiastes said. That's what Solomon said. When a man dies, the spirit returns back to God. Only thing left is the soul. The soul is who you truly are. The body will go to the grave. It will be resurrected at one day. But that soul will be forever. You understand? So when we talk about meditation, I first want you to understand that meditation literally, when done right, can move you from out of the realm of the physical into the realm of the spirit. However, you physically may still be within the flesh. But it can literally transition you from the flesh to the spirit. Okay? Excellent. So let's look at uh, Genesis 18. John, I want you to start... At read one through five, and then I'll kind of come behind you. Just read it so they can hear it. Then the Lord appeared to him by the terebinth trees of Mer, as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. So he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground and said, My Lord, if I have now found favor in your sight, do not pass on by your servant. Please let a little water be, be brought and wash your feet and rest yourself under the tree. And I will bring a morse of bread that you may refresh your hearts. After that, you may pass by in as much as you have come to your servant. They said, do as you have said. Perfect. So here, when it says that, then the Lord appeared, then the Lord, excuse me, appeared to him by the tabernacle trees of Mer, as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. This right here isn't that a man just has his door open and he's sitting there. Right? So that's how people read it and that's how people teach it. Abraham was just sitting in the tent door and then God showed up. It's not quite what happened. Abraham was in the heat of the day. That heat of the day means this was the time that I would do this. They're giving you a time that this was the time that he would go out to do this act. What did they speak in Genesis? That he would come in the cool of the day. This is a meeting time. This isn't just that, oh, this is the weather at the moment. They're, this is spiritual language. This is a meeting time where he is now going to his normal meeting place. And God, I can tell you now, if you want to unlock the voice of God, you need to understand meeting times. Because with a meeting time, there he can find you. 
Not you find him, he can find you. Remember he says, God knows our coming in and our going out. This is an in and out, this is an ebb and flow. But you pray at random and then you want, you want to know what's going on, right? Everything is just happenstance with you. Spirituality happens with intention. Meditation happens with intention. Amen? So the heat of the day represents a meeting time. This isn't just a random thing. All right? So then the Lord appeared to him by the tabernacle trees of man as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. So he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground. Now let's break this down. The Lord appeared to him by the tabernacle trees of Merim as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. So the Lord appeared to him where? By the trees of Merim. But he's sitting inside the tent of his door. The Lord appeared to him while he's sitting at the tent of his door, but it said the Lord appeared to him over there by the tabernacle trees. He's sitting in the door, but his spirit is somewhere else. Meditation. Meditation can move you, meditation will move you beyond the limitations of the physical flesh. Now I'm gonna read it now that you understand. Then the Lord appeared to him by the tabernacle trees of Mam as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. As he was at his normal place for fellowship, as he was at his normal place of meditation, his spirit was somewhere else, and that's where God appeared to him. That's where God appeared to him. Now, of course, most people aren't ready for that, so they try to combat this, so we'll just continue. So he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, now he's meditating, his eyes are closed. When it says he lifted his eyes, he opened his eyes, and he looked, and what does he say? Behold, three men were standing by him, he lifted his eyes. When you lift your eyes, you're looking off to the distance. When he lifted his eyes off to the distance, it says he saw three men, not in the tent door, standing by him. He is lit. Y'all, okay, you know what? Y'all not. You know what? It, it, you just, you know what? I thought, I thought you were going to get with me. I thought you were going to like. I thought you were going to do all this stuff. You guys are still mad because I started late. And I can, it's okay. I told you forgive and I will give. Okay? YouTube, I don't know. I don't feel like you're with me, YouTube. We can mute it, but, you know, you let me know what you want to do. I'm going to give you a second to process while I drink some water. YouTube, I don't feel the love. I don't, I don't, I feel like you're still bitter. I'm just picking with you guys. But are, are, we, are we moving in the right vein? Yes, sir. Then the Lord appeared to him by the tabernacle trees of Merim as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. Let me explain to you the equivalent of this. The Lord appeared to Jason while he was sitting at the door of his home across the street. The Lord appeared to Jason across the street while he was at the door of his house. That's the equivalent of that. The Lord appeared to Jason across the street while he was at the door of his home. Meditation can move you beyond the realms of the flesh, I'm trying to tell you. When I'm teaching you about unlocking God, if I, if I get tomorrow, we're going to start with meditation tomorrow. That one thing alone, we don't have to talk about nothing else. <laughs> Dreams, vision, that one thing, you're good. So he lifted his eyes. And when he lifted his eyes, behold, he saw there were three men standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them. If they're standing by him, why would he run to them? <laughs> you, go, you know what? We're done. <laughs> I could talk to everybody in here. <laughs> I bet y'all forgive me now. <laughs> and I can tell you now, we're just getting started. <laughs> they say, you better sit down somewhere, amen. <laughs> Let me sip some water. 
See, the people in the room, they're with me, but you two, I don't feel the love. I feel like you're still bitter about what happened. They said, my muffin cap is blown back. <laughs> We're doing this all night. So let's keep breaking this down. Then the Lord appeared to him by the tabernacle trees of Merim as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. So God is appearing to him spiritually by virtue of meditation somewhere else from where he physically is. All right? This is, this is different. They, they don't preach this. That, that, you ain't going to catch this down Zion Baptist, AME, CME, whatever. You, <laughs> elemental P, Q, S, T, U, V. So what's happening? He's in meditation. As he's in meditation, he perceives, and then he lifts his eyes and he sees them. What he had within the spirit, he now had in the flesh. Meditation. His eyes are closed. He lifts his eyes, and then he sees three men standing by him. The reason they're standing by him is because his spirit is somewhere else from where he is. When David says, I will lift up mine eyes to where the hills from whence my help comes from. I will project my spirit to where he is. You understand? I will lift mine eyes to the hills. You can just feel it. You can feel the spirit moving through the room as I said that. I will lift mine eyes to the hills. I will project my spirit to where he is. That's why the whole portion was about who can ascend into the hill of the Lord. He that have clean hands and a pure heart and has not lifted up his soul unto idol, nor sworn to vanity deceitfully, so forth and so on. I will lift up mine eyes to the hills. This is different. You understand? Meditation can bring your spirit to the forefront. Remember I said man is body, soul, spirit, but God desires us to function spirit, soul, body. Meditation is the vehicle that can bring us to the forefront. Amen. So he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground and said, My Lord, if I have now found favor in your sight, do not pass on by your servant. Excuse me. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh your hearts. After that, you may pass by inasmuch as you have come to your servant. They said, do as you have said. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah and said, quickly. Now remember, he tells them, you guys can sit under the tree. Abraham hurries back to the tent. This is showing you that these are two different locations. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah and said, quickly, make ready three meals, three measures, excuse me, a fine meal, kneaded and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd, took a tender and good calf, gave it to a young man, and he hastened to prepare it. So he took butter and milk and the calf which he had prepared and set it before him. And he stood by them under the tree as they ate. So this is now he's going back from the tent to the tree. Then they said to him, where's your wife? So he said, here in the tent. Where is your wife? She's here in the tent. But he was just under the tree with them eating. Okay, you know what? You know what? I, we, we got, we, because this could get too deep and we won't be able to, we won't, we won't have enough time. I want to honor people's time, but we'll start with meditation tomorrow, but I'm just kind of helping you. Ah! <laughs> hey! <laughs> Then they said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? So he said, here in the tent. But two seconds ago, they were under the tree as he stood by them and watched them eat. Meditation is deep. He's having a spiritual encounter in the flesh and moves back in the spirit. Ah, okay, you know what? And he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife shall have a son. Sarah was listening in the tent door, which was behind him. Now at this point, we're just reading it. I'm showing you now that you're under grace. We're just reading it, but you're seeing it now. Yes. Remember I told you, we, we could talk about whatever. Grace allows you to step into an atmosphere. I'm just reading at this point. I'm no longer even bringing it out. I brought out one thing, and now you see it. So where do we leave off? 
Thank you. Therefore, Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I have grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being old also? And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I surely bear a child since I am old? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? Now you have to understand meditation brings you to a place where you have conversation without speech. When a man moves beyond the flesh into the spirit, he no longer has to use this. In order to function within this world, we need this. In order for everything that we understand for creation to exist, God had to do what? Speak. Let there be. However, on that side, speech is no longer needed because everything moves by the speed of thought. When it says she said within her heart, he heard her thoughts. That's why Jesus would then say, why would you say this in your hearts? Jesus would not commit himself to men knowing their hearts. He would hear their thoughts. Meditation brings you into a new realm. You've interacted with God doing this, and God is looking to interact with you doing this. God is looking to meet you at the tent of your door in the heat of the day. But you don't have a meeting place prepared, so because you don't have a meeting place prepared, he goes on about for the next man who does. Remember, Abraham was, in, Abraham was in the tent of his door in meditation daily. God was on his way to Sodom. He stopped by through Abraham. God is going to swing by and the person, with the, the person waiting in his door gets the encounter. I want to learn the correct way to meditate. By the time this is done, you'll have it. Don't worry. Somebody said, forget my time. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> forget time. Just teach this thing. So when we talk about meditation, it literally moves you beyond the realm of the flesh into the realm of the spirit. Literally, it moves you beyond. What happens? You transcend bounds. When I say you transcend bounds, you're no longer limited by time, space, and matter. I was talking with John about it yesterday. We understand what we call quantum physics, right? So everything that you see in TV ain't wrong. My son is like a Marvel fanatic, so he loves all the dads of this one, right? <laughs> <laughs> Did you see Thanos? <laughs> right? He loves it. He loves it. He loves it, right? He he Marvel geek. So we went to see we went to see Ant Man and the quantum realm and all that, right? However. What people don't understand is there are dynamics about it that exist. Jesus proved it. He was able to suspend all quantum laws. Time, space, and matter no longer mattered to him. No longer existed to him. So meditation can move you beyond the limitations of the flesh. Where a man is limited by virtue of this vessel, meditation can move, be, move you beyond those realms. Amen? Now I'm going to show you. Let's where, uh, find me with Elijah and Elisha where he's surrounded about on the mountaintops. Is this good? Okay. I'm going to make up for being late, okay? I'm going to give you so much tomorrow, you can be like, man, I don't even care he was late. Somebody said, very true, he did it all within his own mind. Now we're going to wrap up with this. I'm going to beat you there with old trusty Dustin. Second Kings. <laughs> Chapter 6. Almost had you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hold on. I'm looking. Uh... Look at verse 14. Yeah, so let's go to 2 Kings 6, everybody. And actually, so these are the last two scriptures we're reading. Start at verse 8 and go to 17. Now, before you read it, let me say this. 
I am anti, 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 anti read the word, word of God the way he's about to read it. I teach it totally different. Like I'm telling him, hey, read it. So read it real quick. But he knows I teach this. Never read the word of God that way. If you read the word of God that way, you lose the essence of being able to interact with the person behind it. Remember, this leads us to him. As we told the Pharisees, you search this because they're about to read it like he's doing. You search this because in this you think you have eternal life. But if you knew, you would then come to me. He says, you search this. Meaning you guys thought you were going to access power by virtue of what you search. But come to me and I would have given you power. I would have given you an eternal life. So never read the scriptures in that way. If a man wants to interact with God, he must first learn how to savor every verse until there is no more relish. That's what the mystic Madam Guyon would say. If a man ever wants to interact with God, he must learn to first savor each and every morsel until there is no more relish. So when I read that, with the Genesis with Abraham sending the tent of his door, I would read that scripture, meditate on it. Abraham sat in the tent of his door. God appeared to Abraham in the plains of Myrrh as he sat in the tent of his door in the heat of the day. God appeared to Abraham as he sat in the tent of his door at the heat of the day. God appeared to Abraham by the trees of Merim as he sat in the tent of his door at the heat of day. Now Deuteronomy tells us, when you wake up, speak about this. I'm teaching you about meditation. Everything is about meditation now. When you wake up, speak about this word. When you lie down, speak about this word. When you sit down at the dinner table, speak about this word. With your children, speak about this word. When you go about your day, bind it as a sign on your hands. Let it, bind it as a sign upon your hands. Let it be written upon the doorpost. And then it will become as frontlets in your eyes. He said, if you do these things, this word is going to come as frontlets between your eyes. Now, we're going to talk, when we start talking about the Adam, our people are going to be mad, but I'm just telling you now. He told us in Deuteronomy, if you do this, it will become like a frontlet in your eyes. So what do I do? I'm walking to the train. He said, let it be a sign of a man. You appeared to Abra in the tents of Merah, by the trees of Bam, in the tent at the heat of the day. So now when I shake another man's head, he doesn't know the grace that he's getting from me. Why? This word is tied up in here. It's a sign. They don't understand when I lay hands, there's a sign inside of here. You understand? I'm teaching you meditation. Meditation first starts in thought, speech, imagination. Thought. Father, what was that like? Remember, my thoughts leave me to questions. I would like to know more. Would you be so kind to teach me? Would you be so kind to allow me to peer in? Because remember to God, what once was is current to him. So he can put me right in the moment. The past is the present to God. He can put me right into the moment. That's how I met the Lord Jesus. Right into the moment. So I'm telling you this. I didn't come to this just by reading the book. People, people aren't there see me walking, they think I'm crazy, man. And I shake that, God bless you. They don't understand what they're getting. Grace. I have a sign within my hand. Right? When you rise up, speak about it. When you lay down, speak about it. When you walk about your day, speak about it. Write it upon the post of your own. Speak to your children. Let it be a sign upon your hand, and then it will be like front lifting your eyes. If you want your eyes to change, you have to change your meditation. Right? If you want your eyes to change, you have to change your meditation. That make sense? Yes. I'm just showing you the beginning process of how that started, how I came to that. Literally walking with God. What was that like? Hmm, that was special, God. That was so special. I want to know that. I want to experience that. Amen? Right? Excellent. So now I say that to say, don't read how he's going to read. <laughs> just for time's sake, we read like this, but don't read like that. Take your time. I've never done a 365 Bible plan. Why? You can never capture God in that way. Never. Never. And if you listen to me, I suggest you never read a 365-day Bible plan unless you just want a good exercise. You just took a spiritual book and made a corner. You might as well just go get a bestseller. 
literally. You might as well just go get a bestseller. Because this word is to be savored. This word is to be ate. This word is to be enjoyed. This word is to bring us into fellowship. Amen? All right. Now, we're still talking about meditation. Now, the king of Syria was making war against Israel, and he consulted with his servant, saying, My count will be in such and such a place. And the man of God sent to the king of Israel, saying, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrian are coming down there. Then the king of Israel sent someone to the place of which the man of God had told him. Thus he warned him, and he was watchful there, not just once or twice. Therefore, the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing. And he called his servants and said to them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha. The prophet who who is in Israel tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. So he said, go and see where he is that I may send and get him. And it was told, it was told to, told him saying, surely he is in Dalton. All right, I'll take it from here. There's a lot of words getting tongue I know. So y'all excuse me because I'm about to do the same thing. So, therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. So when the Syrians came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, strike this people, I pray, with blindness. And he struck them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. Now, of course, you read on. Elisha then draws them out. of. If you don't know, Elisha draws them out of the city, turns into a whole thing. All right. So now when we jump back to verse 14, it says that the king sent for Elisha. Because they said what? The man is in Dothan. Yes. So he sent for him. When he sends for him, they come and they surround the city. Okay? When they surround the city, this is verse uh, 14. Therefore he sent horses and chariots, great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So his servant goes out in the morning. When he goes out in the morning, he sees that what? The city is surrounded. When he sees that the city is around, he goes back to Elisha the prophet. Our master, the city is surrounded. What shall we do? Do not fear for those with us are more than those who are with them. Now, remember, when I'm teaching about meditation, when we talked about Abraham, Abraham was having interaction by virtue of meditation with the God of heaven, earth, creation, everything, the father of all spirits and these other angels. So some people say, oh, he was the father, son, Holy Spirit. No, this was the father and two angels that were escorting him. Remember, if the father ever comes, the angels prepare the way. OK, he rides upon the wings of the cherubim. So if you're ever going to see him, you're going to see them. That's why the angels were amongst the garden. Why? They have to be there if God's ever going to come. So if you want the presence of God, the angels will be there. Okay? So now, he says, there are more with us than there are with them. He's already aware of who's with him. Remember I said, I'm never alone. I like to walk alone, but I'm never alone. You understand? They think I'm talking to myself. I'm not. Then... Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Now what you have to ask yourself is Elijah's eyes are already open. Eli the ser Elisha's eyes are open, but the servant's eyes are open. That's how he saw them. He saw the men surrounding the city, right? He went out and saw them surrounding the city. So what eyes was he speaking about? I'm telling you, people about speak about things they don't know what they're talking about. They talk about things and they don't. So they demonize what they don't know, and then they lock you out of experiencing God. Right? They lock you out of experience in God because they don't know. His ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. He tells God, Father, I pray, open his eyes that he can see. But his eyes are already open, so this is a different faculty by which he's perceiving now. 
Lord, I pray, open his eyes to him and see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and when he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Now, here's what you have to understand. Elisha is upon Dothan. That's the city. When he opens his servant's eyes, all of a sudden, he sees the chariots of city on the chariots of fire on a mountaintop. Dothan is in a valley. All you got to do is do your research. Dothan is in a valley. But he sees horses, chariots of fire surrounding a mountaintop. And then who does he see the horses surrounding? Who? But Elisha is in the city with him. But he says he, when he opens his eyes, he sees Elijah and the chariots of horses fire surrounding him. Elisha is on Mount Zion. What, did he say? what is Mount Zion? The holy city, the city of God. You have come unto Mount Zion, unto the city, the innumerable angels. Then he opens his eyes, he's on the mountaintop. Elisha's on Mount Zion. Dothan is a city. The city was surrounded, not the mountaintop. They came and surrounded the city, right? But the angels were surrounding the mountaintop. There's more than what meets the eye. Meditation is the thing that can bring you beyond the limitations of this realm into the realm of the spiritual world. Literally, when he opens his eyes, he sees Elijah on the mountaintop with chariots of fire surrounding him. Now, mind you, he didn't say, I see chariots of fire surrounding us. Because he's right there with Elijah. Father, I pray, open his eyes that he could see. He's right there. He didn't say, I see chariots of fire surrounding us. No, I see chariots of fire surrounding him upon the mountaintop. This is an open vision. Remember I told you open vision deals with when the spiritual world of what we understand is the world of spirits of Mount Zion, when these dynamics that function get overlaid right on top of what we experience here. When that happens, that's what's called an open vision. The spiritual world literally gets laid right on top of our natural world and he can see it open vision. So when he says, Father, I pray that you open his eyes so he can see, you don't see open visions with the eyes of your flesh. You, you don't see them like that. You see them here. But what you don't realize is, you think you have eyes here. You have eyes throughout your entire body. Right? You have ear. You think you have ears here, not knowing you have ears in your chest. You have ears at the core of your belly. You have ears throughout your entire being. Think about it. When he talks about the angels, the seraphims, how they cover their face and they cover their eyes so they cannot look upon him, but they have eyes surrounding their entire being. So people say that, right? Oh, you just, they cover their eyes because they got eyes through their entire being. Why? Perception deals with the entire man. Perception, the whole man. Oh, Father, that this will be yielded as your vessel that I can see and that I can hear and that I can perceive. You understand? The spirit can move beyond ways of what we understand. It can move in measures beyond what we understand. Remember I told you, it could suspend time, space, and matter. Time and matter said that Elisha was right here, but within the spirit, there was no balance. He was on Mount Zion. You have come unto Mount Zion. Not your going, you have come. Where the spirits of just men have been made perfect. People are not ready to talk about what happened to the saints of old and where they are and if we can interact with them. To the spirits of just men made perfect. If you get to Mount Zion, you can speak to everybody there. The problem is you in Mount DC right now. <laughs> but meditation can move you beyond this realm into the realms of the spirit. You know what I'm Man of God letting off tonight. No, we're just getting started. Thank you for increasing my capacity to receive. You're welcome. So meditation moves us beyond the limits of the flesh into the realms of the spirit, right? Literally, time, matter, space can all be suspended. You see that with the life of our Lord Jesus. That's why I said when the pictures have it all wrong, right? When you see the pictures of Jesus walking on the water, right? It's a, a white man just kind of just going about his way. <laughs> Nothing like that. Jesus took on spiritual form. When Jesus took on spiritual form, he was like this glass of water. 
You see the difference? Spirit functions like this, not like this. That's why they didn't recognize him. When you read the account, it says that they saw him coming on the water and they were terrified because they thought it was a ghost or they thought it was a spirit. He was fully functioning within his spiritual nature. When he begins to function within his spiritual nature, they say, that's a ghost. That's a spirit. And then he calls out to them and Peter says, well, if it's truly you, allow me to come. The reason he said if it's truly you because he didn't know if it was him or not. Why? Because he didn't look like what he knew. You see that when he resurrected, when he speaks to them, they think he's a gardener. Jesus has, never mind, we won't go there. Okay. <laughs> that, that right there will get me in trouble. But literally, he takes on a different form. When he takes on that different form, they see him walking, then what does he say? Bid me to come. When he bids him to come, Peter steps into that same form. They think Peter's walking on water. No. Peter's walking in spirit. Peter became just like him. That's how he began to walk on the water. And what happens? Peter, when he came back to himself, he began to sink. What happened? When the body came back to the forefront, you're done. To move at a certain measure of the spirit, the spirit has to lead. The moment the body desires and takes back over, that move of the spirit is done. Literally, that move of the spirit, that's what happens. So we give Peter a bad rap. But we spend most of our days in the flesh. We'll talk about Peter didn't have faith and he doubted. No. When Peter came back to himself, that's what caused it. Why? He couldn't believe what he was seeing. He was looking through himself. Remember I told you it was like this glass of water. When Peter saw the waves crashing through his body, what was being suspended, time, space, and matter, he began to sink. Why? He began to see with the wrong eyes. The eyes of the spirit would have said, oh, this is more than possible. Right? More than possible. But what happened? Peter graduated. So when you encounter God, you will have mis missteps, pitfalls, mistakes, all those kind of things. Well, I'm going to teach you about meditation tomorrow in a, in a more extensive way, like how to, how to do it. I guarantee you, you ain't going to be able to sit still for two seconds. But what happened? Your spiritual capacity will increase. Then your spiritual capacity will increase to be able to quiet yourself and fill yourself. Because meditation isn't about emptying yourself, it's about filling yourself. When you fill yourself, this is different from the meditation of the world where just empty your thoughts and think nothingness and water and just, no. We fill ourselves. This, is told, this, this meditation I'm going to teach you about is totally different from what they talk about in the... I don't even know what they talk about, but I know it's weird stuff, right? But Peter graduated is what I'm saying. What I'm saying is you will start here and God will bring you here. So when we look at Peter in prison, Peter understands meditation in a totally different way now. Peter's in prison, and when he's in prison, find that for me. I'll read it, but just find, find it for me where it's at. Jesus, I'm ready. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Ask chapter 12. Thank you. <clears throat> now, Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer. And for you two, this is Acts chapter 12. I'm starting at verse 5 to when I stop. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. And when Herod was about to bring him out, that night Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers. So Peter's in chains, and they have him on heavy guard duty. It's not that he's just locked up. He's on heavy guard watch. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison. And he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. Now, first thing you need to see is that the angel strikes him. This is a spiritual being, yet he feels it within the flesh. Right? So the angel strikes him. Then the light shines, and he struck him on the side. He raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. His chains did not break. His chains were not unlocked. They fell off of him. Listen, he did not unlock his chain. He did not break his chain. 
his chains fell off of him. If a chain fall, if my clothes were to fall off of me right now, you do know they would have to fall through my body in order for it to happen. Understand, if my clothes fall off of me, there's two ways it can happen. I can be undressed or they can fall off. If they fall off, they will have to move beyond the bounds of the flesh. Remember I told you Peter, Peter, Peter's not the same as what he was when he fell in the water. We give Peter a bad rep. Peter is deep. Then the angel said to him, gird yourself and tie your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, put on your garment and follow me. So he went out and followed him and did not know what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. Peter is moving in the spirit, but he thinks he's in a vision. Meditation can move you beyond the realms of the flesh into the realms of the spirit. Peter thinks he's having a literal vision. He doesn't even know if it's real. You know, they say, I got to pinch myself to see if I'm awake. That doesn't work in the spirit because the spirit has a body also. When people start talking that, I know, they have, they, I know they're limited in what they're talking about. The spirit has a body also. You can't do this when you're caught up. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. So now he knows what is done by the angel was real, but he thought he was seeing a vision. When they were past the first and second guard posts, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. This, remember I said, moving beyond the bounds of space, matter, and time. And they went out and went down the street, and immediately the angel departed from him. And when Peter came to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod from all expectation of the Jewish people. Peter wasn't even sure why the whole, when the gates, the chains fell off, he don't know. He gets up, he doesn't know. He's following the angel, he does not know. He gets past this door, he doesn't know. He gets past the next door, he does not know. The iron gate opens on its own. The angel doesn't know, but the iron gate opens on its own accord. He still doesn't know. He gets outside, the angel party says, oh, God was with me. He comes back to himself. When he comes back to himself, he's no longer fully spirit. He's back within the flesh. He says, oh, God has delivered me. The problem with you, you don't have meditation, so you don't have the stillness within your spirit. So God comes to visit you in a dream, but you flash out of it into the next thing. Why? You have no stillness of spirit. You come back to yourself. You try to be quiet, you come back to yourself. You try to perceive, you come back to yourself. Everything is the problem is you. You keep coming back to yourself when God wants to get you out of yourself. You understand? When we talk about unlocking the voice of God, God wants to bring you beyond the limitations of yourself. But if you're stuck in the limitations of yourself, you're limited by what God can do with you. Now, Peter understands it because when Peter came back to himself in the water, what happened? He drowned. Peter this time said, I'm going to just wait this out. Calm spirit. Quiet spirit. You see that? Does that make negative tie together for you? Yeah. Calm spirit. Peter said, I'm going to wait this out. Just, I'm not sure. This, I'm just going to go with this. I'm, I'm just going to roll with it. I'm just going to be here in the moment. Exist in the moment with God. And that can happen through meditation. Amen? Amen. Excellent. So tomorrow, we will continue. And it's going to get better. And with God's grace, we'll be on time. Yeah. Now, this part, I'm not certain. If it's going to be on Zoom, YouTube. I like YouTube personally because that's, you know, the people we have fun in the chat. And it's what I know. So I'm kind of stretching beyond what I know. And I came back to myself today too, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so perhaps tomorrow we won't we won't have any hiccups. However, if you stay connected on Instagram, we'll make sure in the email we'll make sure the notifications are out. Those of you with us in person will start at the same time. It'll be a good time. We'll do some things, it'll be fun. But I want you to just consider that through the night that Father, help me to not come back to myself when you come to visit me. Help me to be still and quiet in the inner man. Help me to wait on you. The man who can wait on God knows how not to come back to himself. You understand? Amen. This whole thing is about him. So even though we're talking about dreams, even though we're talking about visions, even though we're talking about all these different spiritual dynamics, it is all about the Lord Jesus. He is the one that will always reveal the Father to us. You will never hear me not stress that enough because people seek these wrong things, and this is how they get duped out of what God has for them. Okay? 
So tomorrow we're going to talk about visions, dreams, some of the hows, but the guarantee is grace is there. Okay? So even if we run out of time, whatever happens is going to be good. So we, we got a little more out of there, so I do apologize. And then tomorrow's going to be good. I love you. I bless you. We're going to leave this up. We're not going to gatekeep. We're going to leave it up. And then we we'll also got it recorded, so we'll send it to everybody. And we won't mute tomorrow also. All right, I love you. God bless you. See y'all soon. Yes. Yes.
can't do this alone. God help me. Help, whoa, God help me. Can't do this alone. God help me. What the? Yeah. God help me. Can't do this alone. God help me. What the? Yeah. God bless me. Can't do this alone. God bless me. Yeah. I ain't coming off the mountain till I get my blessing. And I don't know where it is, so I watch where I'm stepping. And I'm walking with this peace, but it's never aggression. Cause once upon a time, I had to learn a little lesson. Read it in the holy book, I know the reverend said it. You're misunderstood, but if you read it and let it open up the truth, you would find that it would open up everything inside of you. But everybody wants to be put on. How you even making all these songs? Like how you get the money, how you get the fame? But why don't you ask what's the cash behind the diamond rings though? I pay attention, I'm listening to your lingo. Who I serve, he got eyes like an ego. He see everything. I promise you won't get away without anything, girl. Yeah. <laughs> That's a cold hot truth I'm being honest Don't ever think that you know my mom He ordered my steps So I know that I will never lose I'm covered in unseen blood Like I said, I truly can't see it But it's on me There's something different about the kids Something funny Maybe if I switch my jersey They would love me But what does it matter If he ain't rooting for me God help me What the fuck yeah. Can't do this alone God help me Yeah, I ain't coming off the mountain till I get my 
place And I don't know where it is, so I watch where I'm stepping And I'm walking with this peace, but it's never aggression Cause once upon a time, I had to learn a little lesson Read it in the holy book, I know the reverend said it You're misunderstood, but if you read it and let it Open up the truth, you would find that it would open up everything inside of you But everybody wants to be put on How you even making all these songs? Don't you ask what's the cash behind the diamond rings though I pay attention, I'm listening to your lingo Who I serve, he got eyes like an ego He see everything I promise you won't get away without anything though Yeah, <laughs> but that's the cold hard truth I'm being honest, don't ever think that you know my mom He ordered my steps so I know that I will never lose I'm covered in unseen blood Like I said, I true, you can't see it But it's on me there's something different about the kids, something funny Maybe if I switch my jersey, they would love me But what does it matter if he ain't rooting for me? God help me with the, yeah, I can't do this alone God help me Songs. Like how you get the money, how you get the fame But why don't 
you ask what's the cash behind the diamond rings though I pay attention, I'm listening to your lingo Who I serve, he got eyes like an ego He see everything I promise you won't get away without anything girl. Yeah, <laughs> But that's the cold hard truth I'm being honest, don't ever think that you know my mood He ordered my stuff so I know that I will never lose I'm covered in unseen blood Like I said, I truly can't see it But it's on me There's something different about the kids, something funny Maybe if I switch my jersey, they would love me But what does it matter if he ain't rooting for me? God help me with the, yeah, I can't do this alone God help me God help me Can't do this alone God help me with the, yeah, God help me Can't do this alone God help me Behind the diamond rings, though. I pay attention, I'm listening to your lingo. Who I serve, he got eyes like an ego. He see everything. I promise you won't get away without anything, girl. Yeah. <laughs> But that's the cold hard truth. I'm being honest, don't ever think that you know my mom. He ordered my stuff, so I know that I will never lose. I'm covered in unseen blood. Like I said, I truly can't see it. But it's on me. There's something different about the kids, something funny. Maybe if I switch my jersey, they would love me. But what does it matter if he ain't rooting for me? God help me. With the, yeah, can't do this alone. God help me. God help me. Can't do this alone. God help me. With the, yeah, God help me. Can't do this alone. God help me. With the, yeah, God bless me. Can't do this alone. God bless me.
Behind the diamond rings, though I pay attention, I'm listening to your lingo Who I serve, he got eyes like an ego He see everything I promise you won't get away with not anything, girl Yeah, <laughs> but that's the cold hard truth I'm being honest, don't ever think that you know my mood He ordered my steps so I know that I will never lose I'm covered in unseen blood Like I said, I truly can't see it But it's on me There's something different about the kids Something funny Maybe if I switch my jersey, they would love me But what does it matter if he ain't rooting for me? God help me What the fuck, yeah Can't do this alone, God help me
Behind the diamond rings, though I pay attention, I'm listening to your lingo Who I serve, he got eyes like an ego He see everything I promise you won't get away with nothing Something different about the kids, something funny Maybe if I switch my jersey, they would love me But what does it matter if he ain't rooting for me? God help me 